What we're going to talk about uh, today is calorie density. And I know this sounds almost like an infomercial, how to eat more, weigh less, and live longer. But <laughs> right. Call now. Operators are standing by. But uh, as you're going to see, this is really fascinating. And I'm going to explain to you what you're doing here and why it works so well and give you some of the science and numbers behind it. Before I do, though, I want to show you um, a picture. We're going to start with a picture and end with a picture. Remember yesterday I... Remember yesterday I was... Remember yesterday I was saying how times have changed in the last 30 years? This is a movie theater in 1955. Do you notice anything different? There's no food. And everybody is thin. In fact, look here. They're sitting two in a seat. When I grew up, I used to go to movies and sit in the same seat as my brother. I'm not sure why we did those things, but apparently people did that. Now they have to make movie seats bigger. Not only is there no food, there's no way to put the food. There's no cup holders. I got a movie theater near me called um, Premier, and they have uh, reclining love seats with trays and wait in a bar, uh, they have a full service restaurant and a bar. Oh yeah, in the movie theater. So have times changed? Unbelievable. So that's what I was showing you last night. What we're going to do is I'm going to introduce and go over a few concepts. One, we're going to mention carbohydrates. I mentioned it last night. We're going to talk about calorie density. We're going to talk about something called satiety. And we're going to talk about a little bit about living long, and then I'll put it all together for you. And I even got props. Okay? So, I mentioned this yesterday. Let's just briefly touch on carbohydrates, because, you know, people are so confused. You could come here two, three times, listen to these talks, you walk out, and you go, yeah, but should I really eat carbs? <laughs> right? Right. Well, why should you eat them? I mentioned it last night. High carbohydrate foods, if they're the right carbs, are the richest sources of vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, microminerals, trace minerals, and energy. They're the best fuel for your body. This is why you want to eat them. Now, if you cut out foods that are high in carbs, you can lose weight because you'll cut out calories, but you're also going to mortgage your long-term health for short-term weight loss because you're going to cut out the most nutrient-rich foods. So you don't want to do it. Now, the problem is, Nobody really knows how to tell a good carb from a bad carb. You know, we know there's a difference. There's good fats and bad fats. There's good carbs and bad carbs. And you hear things like glycemic index, right? And you hear things like um, complex and simple, right? Have you all heard that? To me, those are all way too complex. I've made it simpler. If you want to know the difference between a, the carbs you should eat and the carbs you might want to avoid is this test. The carbs you should eat are unrefined, and the ones you should avoid are the refined. And unrefined carbs are very simple. You could eat them the way they grow in the garden. Make sense? So this potato, grow in the garden? Can you eat it this way, except for the fact you might cook it or peel it? So is it good for you? Okay, but what if I cut it up into sticks, put it in the deep fryer for a little bit, and... No, what did, I, what did I change about it? I, I refined or processed it in some way, and the more I do it, the worse it gets. So this is really the simplest way. Can I eat it the way it grew in the garden, except for the fact that I might want to cook it or peel it? Very simple. You don't have to be a biochemist to get this. So, now the problem was in 1980, when they looked around the world and they looked at all the long-lived populations, they ate diets that were very high in carbs. I'm going to show you the numbers. Some were 80, 85 percent carbohydrates. And these, that's why they recommended we eat more carbs and less fat. And what they meant was that we should eat carbs like this. Brown rice, oatmeal, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, starchy vegetables, leafy greens, even potatoes. These were the foods they were hoping we would eat. They're very low in calories, very low in calorie density. They're packed with water, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. All the fresh fruits, veggies, starchy vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. But is this what Americans ate since 1980? No. This is what they ate. All these that are packed with calories, packed in calorie density, stripped of the nutrients. All the cakes, cookies, crackers, pretzels, chips, 
and all the rest. So what you're looking at makes up 90% of the carbohydrate intake in the United States. 90% of the carbs we eat are white flour, white sugar, white rice, white pasta. The average adult American eats 0.9 servings of whole grains a day. That's it, 0.9. So we got heavy on these, and what did we blame? Corn. Grapes. Right? People are afraid to eat these foods. Yet they didn't cause the problem. Now when we, we refine a food, three things happen, and I put them here because we're going to come back to it in a minute. The first thing that happens is you take out the water. All right? It's one of the ways you dry fruit or you... Right. Second is you take out or you reduce the amount of fiber. And the third is you reduce or eliminate nutrients. The more refining and processing you do, the more this happens. So these are going to be important in a few minutes, so realize this is what refining does. Now here's an example. What I'm showing you is 200 calories of corn. On the left is cornmeal. I, knew, I know it looks like a sunny side up egg, but uh, especially by now. But it's a cornmeal. On the right is 200 calories of corn. Now, which one do you think is better for you? The one on the right. Which do you think tastes better? The one on the right. Which do you think has more fiber, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and everything else good for you? The one on the right. And this tastes great. How many of you love corn? We all do. Right. How many of you have ever like, sat down in front of the TV with a bag of cornmeal and a spoon? <laughs> Some of you were reluctant, but I thought you were going to raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so then if I make this into this in order to get you to eat it, what do I got to do to it? I got to probably add a little oil, maybe a little salt, maybe a little sugar. Make it into something. Definitely put some salt and sugar in it so you'll eat it. So for 25 years, Americans have been getting fat on this, right? And then you ask them how they got heavy and what do they blame? Corn. Wasn't the corn. So that's carbohydrates. You got the difference? Real simple. You don't have to be a biochemist. Just understand the closer it is to the way it was grown in nature, the better for you. Okay, now let's talk about calorie density. Does everybody in here know what calorie density is and what that term refers to? Okay. I'm going to remind you. Okay, what is calorie density? Very simply, it's the number of calories in a given weight of food. And generally in the world, what we talk about is calories per pound. If you read the research, they do calories per gram. But in the world, we'll do pounds. Because how many of you know what a grams of food look like? Nobody. But when you go shopping, do you buy food by the pound? So we're going to talk about it by pound. Now if we go into a grocery store and we took all the food and lined it up by calorie density and we found the food that was the lowest and the food that was the highest, there would be a 40-fold difference. So, calorie de so if we have a pound of food, the amount of calories packed in it can vary tremendously. Now, a lot of people are looking for a simple way to know if a food is fattening, right? Is that fattening? Is this fattening? Should I eat that? Well, calorie density won't tell you that. But what calorie density will tell you is how easy it is to overeat on a food if you know the calorie density. Doesn't make it fattening necessarily, but you know how easy it is to overeat. Let me show you a chart. What we're going to see on the left is the amount of calories in a pound. What we're looking down here is just some sample foods. Now, all numbers are going to be edible portion. So, you know, ready to eat. Got rid of the peel, the rind, or whatever. So if I had a pound of broccoli, I got 128 calories, which is very low. If I had a pound of fresh oranges, I got 211. If I had a pound of oatmeal, I got 325. If I got a pound of baked potatoes, I got 495. Red beans, 550. Whole wheat bread, even whole wheat bread. Anybody know how many calories in a pound of whole wheat bread? <laughs> right. 1,120. 
How about a pound of Oreos? I will worry if any of you get this right. <laughs> 2,200 virtually. And what about almonds, nuts and seeds? Anybody know how many calories in a pound of nuts and seeds? Almost, almost 3,000. 2,600, some run up to 28 and 3,000. How about oil and pure fat? 4,000 calories per pound. So as you can see, between the lowest and the highest, there's a, a virtually 40-fold difference. Everybody see it? And some vegetables are actually lower than 100. So there's an over 40-fold difference. Now, I don't know about you, but the very first time I saw this chart a while ago, you know what I said to myself? Who cares? No, really, I'm being honest. I said, who cares? Because I've never eaten a pound of olive oil. I've never eaten a pound of Oreos. I'm, I don't think I've ever eaten a pound of bread. I know I haven't eaten a pound of broccoli, so who cares? Right? Any of you thinking that? Okay, so I'm the only one. <laughs> Let me show you why it matters. Let's say I have a specific food. These are carrots. All right? This is a, you know, couple cups. And uh, here I have a bowl of carrots. It's smaller. This is more like a cup. Now, when I compare these, is the amount of calories between the two bowls different? That was not a trick question. <laughs> Are the amount of calories different? Yes. And the point of this is any time I have a food and I change the serving size, what happens to the calories? It changes. It goes up or down depending on the serving size. So if I want to know calories, I also have to know the calories for every serving size I might ever eat of food, correct? Correct. But if I change the serving size, does the calorie density change? No. The calorie density does not change. It stays the same. Calorie density is what we call a constant. And in math, when you're doing equations, it's good to have a constant. So calorie density is a constant. So I may never eat a pound of olive oil, and I may never eat a pound of broccoli. But no matter how much broccoli I have and how much olive oil I have, will the olive oil always be 40 times more concentrated? That's the point of it. And I mean, just to put this in perspective for you, you might not eat a pound of olive oil, but has anybody in here ever eaten a tablespoon of olive oil? That tablespoon of olive oil have more calories packed into it than a full pound of broccoli, virtually. See the difference? So it doesn't matter whether you eat a pound or not. It's a constant that gives you perspective. Now, let's think for a minute. Which side of the chart do you think the foods are easier to overeat on? The left side or the right side? <laughs> the right side. We don't get a lot of broccoli bingers coming through here. <laughs> in fact, I think they died out in the, like, how, you know, like the Neanderthal time. They were sitting eating their broccoli and a dinosaur got them. <laughs> so, right. How hard is it to overeat on broccoli? It's impossible. What'd you say? Pretty tough. Pretty tough. How hard is it to overeat on Oreos and almonds? Right. Now, this doesn't make... Okay, is it easy to overeat on almonds? Yes. But does that make almonds fattening? No. No, no. What if you only had one or two almonds? Would that be fattening? No. But I've never known any human being to eat one or two almonds. So are you more likely to overeat on the almonds than on the broccoli? See the issue? See why this is important? So calorie density is giving you a number, and since 1980, there's just been probably 100 studies on this. 50 or so came out of Penn State, alone with Barbara Rolls. It's fascinating what you'll see what happens with this info. In fact, here's one of the studies. She followed people over a few days to watch the amount of food they ate. She didn't tell them anything. She just watched them. And it turned out that regardless of what you ate, the amount of the weight of the foods you ate it's pretty similar. So the amount, the weight of the food, this is food taken grams, was pretty similar over a few days. People eat a certain amount of food each day. 
But depending on whether it was high in calorie density, ED means energy density or calorie density. Whether it was low or high, look what happened to the caloric intake. Because we ate a similar amount of weight of food, so if we change the calorie density, what happens to the calories we take in? It changes. See how important this is? So you still get to eat all you want, but if you change the calorie density, what happens to your caloric intake? It could go up or down, depending which way you go. So let us review. <laughs> you know, I stay up all night thinking of these things. So I appreciate a laugh or two occasionally. We're going to cover a lot. Uh, I, I didn't get hugged enough as a kid. That's why I do this. Okay, we're going to cover a lot today. So I just want to review, because I know some of you said, you know, last night that was a lot of information. So I want to make sure we get this. So let us <laughs> review. What we've learned so far is we want to avoid foods that are calorie rich and processed. <laughs> so our key point as of this moment is <laughs> cut the crap. <laughs> you like that? That one took a few weeks to think of. <laughs> I stay up all night thinking of these things. It's sad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we got carbohydrates, right? And we got calorie density. Now let's talk about satiety. Everybody familiar with this word? It comes from the same root word as satisfaction, and satiation. And basically, satiety is the physical feeling of being full and satisfied. Now, I know there's other things that contribute to satiety, psychological and all the rest, but what we're going to talk about today is the physical feeling of being full and satisfied. I mean, anybody in here ever been hungry? Yeah, wrong crowd, sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you all know what hunger is. Well, you know, you're really hungry, you go out to eat, eat a big meal, and you know that feeling you get? That's satiety. That's what we're talking about. And um, it's a powerful built-in survival mechanism. Now the problem with a lot of diets and approaches to eating is they limit the amount of food you can eat, which stimulates hunger. But hunger is a powerful built-in survival mechanism. You just can't beat... How many of you have tried to defeat hunger with willpower? How good does that work? Maybe a few hours, maybe a day or two, and then you eat everything that isn't nailed down in the house. <laughs> right. And then they come out with different diets and different pills, and they tell you these diets will work because they'll stop you from being hungry because they have more protein or fat, or they have certain ratios, right? Or they give you supplements, and this will help quell your hunger. We're all fighting hunger, but hunger's not the problem. Just like your desire to drink beverages, right? Or breathe air. That's not the problem. The problem is we've changed the food supply and what it is we can satisfy our hunger with. And let me show you. We're going to do like a real experiment here. I think yesterday I pretty much convinced you it's calories in versus calories out, right? We really can't change that. It's calories in versus calories out. So what I want to do is I'm going to put two foods up here. Let's say we're going to have a snack. You know, maybe like 100 calories or so. I'm going to put two foods up here. Right here I'm going to put the picture of one. Right here I'm going to put the picture of the other. They're both going to be equal calories. What I want you to do is look at the foods and see if you can determine which one will fill you up more than the other. Okay? Now they've done these studies, so we're going to kind of like simulate the study. You won't actually get to eat it. We'll just look up here. So one food will be here, one food will be there and then you'll see which one fills you up more, okay? Everybody ready? Okay, oh, and uh, do me a favor. Just in case you get this right away, don't say anything out loud, okay? I want to give everybody an equal chance this time, okay? So everybody ready? Two foods equal calories. All you got to do is see which one is more filling. Okay, so we got two little soy chicken nuggets. And we got one and a quarter cups of vegetable lentil soup. 
Don't say anything yet. There are people still thinking on this one, okay? We'll give them a few minutes. Everybody think they got an answer? Which one do you think? The soup. Now, if you went to medical school or dietetics school or you studied biochemistry and physiology, they would tell you all different things about what fills you up. You might hear about chemicals and hormones and enzymes like CCK and ghrelin, ghrelin, and leptin. You might hear fat is more filling and all these other things, right? Just forget about it. <laughs> just pretend you just walked in off the street, which I think many of you did. <laughs> You just walk in off the street, you don't know anything about biochemistry, chemistry, food, or anything. Just take a wild guess. What do you think it is about the vegetable lentil soup that will fill you up more than the soy chicken nuggets? Anybody? Volume. Volume. Man, there's just more of it. And it turns out that's right. They actually did these studies where they fed people equal calories of food to see which was the most filling. And they did it short-term, long-term, subjective, and objectively. So pretty good studies. And they found out that all foods that fill you up have three things in common. And can anybody guess what number one was? <laughs> Reading my props, huh? Number one was water. And that kind of makes sense, because what does water take up a lot of? Space. And filling up the space in the stomach actually contributes to satiety. Because as you'll learn more about this weekend on the outside of the stomach, you have these little nerves called stretch receptors. And when you fill the stomach up, they stretch a little, they send signals to the brain which help release all those chemicals telling you you're... Right? Don't you all like to get that feeling of full? So water is very important. Water helps, gives you that. And water also has a lot of weight, which helps give that stretch. Because some things have lots of volume, but they don't have a lot of weight, right? Like air. So water was very important. Anybody want to guess what number two was? That's right. <laughs> fiber. <laughs> now, fiber doesn't make sense when you think about it, like, wa like water does. Because fiber doesn't take up a lot of space, it doesn't have a lot of volume. But do you know what you get when you mix a lot of water and a lot of fiber together? You know what you get? You get a lot of... Did you say gas? <laughs> That's true. You get a lot of gas in the beginning. But you get something called... bulk. Right? And it turned out that bulk was the biggest contributor to your feeling full. Now, nutrients did play a role. You do have these nutrient receptors, and nutrients were important, were important but it turns out they're not the most important. So when they tell you to eat a diet high in protein or high in fat because that'll fill you up the most, it's not true. I could take two foods with the exact same amount of protein in them, and uh, guess which one will fill you up more? The one that has the most bulk. Right. Think about that. So it's not just the protein or the fat, and I'm going to show you here in a minute. Um, so here's what they did in the studies. So they did all these studies, they looked at all these foods, and let me show you the connection. What they found out is foods that are really bulky have a very low calorie density. And you know why? Because it, they have a lot of water, and water has a lot of weight, but how many calories? None. So it has all this weight with no calories, so the calorie density is very low, but they also found out those foods are very filling because they're bulky and they create the stretch. Now, so this was filling. Boiled potatoes was one of the most filling foods tested. They almost couldn't overeat on them. Now, here's what else. What if they took the potato, what if I took the potato, put a little oil on it, right? What would happen to the calories? Go way up. Would it fill me up anymore? No, so calorie density, when you add fat, calorie density goes way up. Satiety doesn't really change, but per calorie it actually goes down. Okay, what if I put some honey on the potato? I don't know if people do that, but just... 
But if I put honey on, would we have a similar thing? Would calories go up? Not as high as the fat, but they would still go up. Would it fill you up anymore? No. So what they found out is if you add fat, white flour or white sugar to food, the calorie density goes up, but you don't get any fuller. So let me sum up 50, uh, the last 20 years of research. Bulky foods fill you up for few calories. Foods that are high in fat, sugar, and white flour do the opposite. Okay, now here's a sample of the United States. They went and did a study, took a sample of the United States, look at what they eat, and they looked at the percentage of fat and the calorie density. And there was a significant difference. As the percentage of fat went up in their diet, the amount of calories they consumed went up, and the as the percentage of fat went up, the calorie density went up, and the amount of calories they took in went up. So forget about all the other stuff you used to hear about fat. You want a great reason to limit the amount of fat? It limits the calorie density, which decreases your chance of overeating. Right there. Now, we were playing around a little earlier. I mean, we were having fun. Well, I hope you were having fun. I had some fun. I showed you the, the nuggets and the soup. That was, you know, that was easy. But now I want to show you two other foods. They're going to be about 800 calories. And this is going to get tough. So pay attention. So we're going to do the experiment again. I'm going to put two foods up here. They're both going to be about 800 calories. I want to see if you can tell which one will fill you up the most. All right, everybody ready? By the way, <laughs> if you get this right away, do not say anything. Please give everybody a chance. Okay, you ready? Okay, we have a cup of cashews and we have six small baked potatoes. Do not say anything yet. So, with salsa, that's correct. Somebody, yeah, with salsa. We'll leave it at that. Okay, which one do you think will fill you up more? The potatoes. Why? What do the potatoes have more of that the cashews do? Bulk. Bulk. Now, are these high in fat? Yeah, yeah they're 75% fat. Is this low in fat? Yeah. It's 1% fat. So is fat filling? No. no, not at all. Now, does this make cashews fattening? No. no. Not necessarily. What if you ate just one or two cashews? That's not right. You're right. We know nobody does that. Okay, now I'm going to do some other comparisons. You ready? So this one was pretty easy. <laughs> Enough said over there, right? Okay, look at this one. Oh, we did this one already, but I want to make another point. <laughs> Is this high in fat? 70-80%. Is this low in fat? Yeah. Under 10. So is fat what filled you up? What filled you up? The bulk. Everybody got that. Here we go. Two low-fat fig newmans, not to mention anybody in particular, and one small cantaloupe. They're both 140 calories. Do you see the difference? Which would fill you up more? The cantaloupe. Now let me ask you a question. In 1980, you heard you should go on a low-fat diet, right? So you go to the supermarket or the whole food store and you find all these low-fat foods and you fill up on those. Do you see the problem? If you eat all you want, what happened to your caloric intake? It's too high. But what if you eat just the right amount of calories? Then what's happened? Now you're hungry all day long. Is that going to happen with these foods? Now just for the record, do you know that the percentage of uh, Fat, carb, and protein is almost identical. They almost have the same ratio. So is it the ratio or the amount of protein, the carb, or the fat that fills you up? Because those two are pretty equal. What fills you up more? Bulk. It's simple. Look at this one. Here's a... <laughs> on the left, we have a two-pound fresh pineapple. On the right, we have four ounces of gummy bears. Both are 450 calories. Now, I put this one up there because everybody's anti-sugar these days, right? You can't have sugar. Sugar's no good. can't have carbs. And I think that's crazy because, you know, sugar's good for you. I mean, does everybody know what the, the best fuel for your body is? 
Gummy bears. Make a note of that. I've got to fix the slide, okay? Gummy bears. Right. What's the fuel that your body runs on, the preferred fuel? What do you... Glucose. That's a fancy name for sugar. Now, your body will also burn another fuel. Anybody know what it is? Fat. Whoever said it is correct. The two fuels your body likes to burn, number one is sugar, number two is fat. Now, every now and then you hear somebody say, oh, oh I'm, I need some energy. I, I got to get some protein. Right? You ever hear that? Well, just realize when somebody tells you that, they just told you they know nothing about physiology and biochemistry because that's not what your body wants to use for energy. And in fact, it's a difficult process. Your body uses carbs first and secondary is fat. So, you know, when you work out, some of you get an exercise, your muscles burn up some carb and they also burn up some fat. And some of us are looking to burn up a little bit more fat, right? But there's parts of your body that can't burn fat. Parts of your body can only burn sugar, glucose. And anybody know what part of your body it is? Brain. The brain. That's why I don't get it when people are so anti-sugar and they want to avoid sugar. I mean, I don't know about them, but my brain, very important to me. <laughs> and it needs sugar every day. And they've actually done studies. I mean, the, um, there's uh, recommended minimum intakes of sugar just to fuel the brain. Anybody know how much that is, a recommended minimum intake of sugar you need just to fuel the average brain? 500 calories a day just to fuel the average brain. Now, I had mine tested. Mine burns about 750 a day. But <laughs> Oh, I'm smart. You're very nice. Because the last time I was here, somebody raised their hand and said, Why? Is your... Is yours less efficient? <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> I said, don't make fun of me. I have the props. Okay, so is sugar the problem or is the package the problem? I mean, these both have the same amount of calories and the same amount of sugar. Are they equal to you? No. What's 90% of the weight and volume of the pineapple you're going to eat there? Water, fiber, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and a great package and great matrix, just right for you. What's 90% of the weight and the volume of this? Sugar. So is sugar the problem or the package it came in? It's the package. Don't be afraid of sugar. Once again, get it in its whole natural form. Now, what I think is the real irony is they take foods like this, they process and refine the heck out of them, so we're left with this white crystalline powder, which is sweet, but doesn't really have a flavor. It's just sweet. So then they make it into things like this, but to get kids to eat it, what do they flavor it as? This. <laughs> Does anybody see that irony? Just give them the pineapple. So then we have people who have been loading up on these for 20 years. They got heavy, and then what do they say? I can't eat pineapple. It has sugar in it. So, okay, here's a few more I just want to show you so you can get the point. Every one of them will be 200 calories. That's a pad of butter, just in case you forgot what it looked like. <laughs> and those are grapes, 200 calories, which would be better for you, which would be more filling, which would have more fiber, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and everything. Okay, here we have a little bit of almonds. Here we have carrots. Same 200 calories. See the difference? So you see the problem if we put bowls of almonds out in the back? It's <laughs> we would have this room packed. It's not that almonds are bad for you, but what would happen to all of you? We would overeat. And it's not your fault. So, here we go again. French fries and honeydew melon. See the difference? And which would be better for you? The one on the right. Right. That's olive oil and sliced apples. Same calories. Which would fill you up more? Which would be healthier? Right. There's broccoli and pretzels. Are you drooling over the broccoli now or the pretzels? <laughs> This was the red meat guy, so I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> See the difference? Now, I'm not saying you should only eat raw broccoli. I'm just making a point. And is everybody getting the point? 
Okay, good, because now it gets harder. Hershey Kisses and those little red peppers we occasionally have out in the back. See why we put the peppers out? No. No. <laughs> okay. Potato chips and celery. Every now and then somebody says, you know, I'm really enjoying this diet, but I would like something crunchy. And I'm like, eat crisp celery, it's very cr crunchy. And they say, no, 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 I want something that's crunchy and kind of has like a salty flavor. <laughs> so I said, eat crisp celery. It's crunchy and kind of has a salty flavor. And they say, no, that's not quite what I want. And I say, just admit it, you want potato chips. <laughs> okay, so let's look at it a little different. So let's say you were going to eat 1,600 calories. Let's look at three different levels of calorie density based on typical what people might eat and see how much food you get. If you were at a lower calorie density of 635 calories per pound and you ate 1,600 calories, you get two and a half pounds of food. Not bad. This is in grams. If you were at a higher calorie density at 820, you only get just over two pounds. You get a half a pound less. I don't know about you, but I like to eat. If I was at 1,000 calories per pound, I only get 1.7. That's 40% less food. This is 20% less and then another about 15% um, less. So I get 35% less food if I increase my calorie density. See where we're going with this? See how we're going to eat more, weigh less? So let's sum it up. Let's just give you some principles. No, we're not done yet. We'll be here till nine, but I'm just, just <laughs> kidding. We could do that uh, my Bonnie thing again if you want. Okay, so what I did is I averaged out the food groups. You don't have to know every food. You don't have to know what grapes are and bananas. You don't have to know what carrots and celery. You just have to know the food group, and there's only a couple you got to know. So here it is. Vegetables on average are 100 calories a pound. Some go down as low as 70, some as high as 200. On average, it's 100. Let's make math easy, okay? Fruits actually average around 250, but I wanted to make math easy, so I rounded up to 300. Most fruits are around 2 to 250. Unrefined carbohydrates, that's the potatoes, the rice, the sweet potatoes, the oatmeal, all that good stuff you're eating here, the way they grow in nature, are around 500. Beans, legumes, a little higher. They run around 550. A couple of them will run up to six. So I put 600. I'm giving, you know, making sure we, I give a little higher so you're covered. Fatty protein, like you might get in a restaurant. When you start looking at like, you know, some of the steaks they serve and all that, they could go up to 12 to 1400. Leaner cuts might be a little less, so I rounded it off. Refined carbohydrates, bread, dry cereal, crackers, even if they're whole grain, 12 to 1400 calories a pound. Why are they so high in calorie density, even if they're whole grain? What are they missing? Remember, what was your friend in lowering calorie density? Water. What do they call all those foods? dry goods. They're going to be calorie dense. Yes? Is this how they trick us with the labels by adding water and making it fat-free or low-fat? Okay, who told her the secret? <laughs> that, um, yes, actually we're going to do a whole talk on that. And uh, one of the tricks they do is they play some games with adding water and dilutions. But I don't want to give that away. So I want you to come tomorrow, but yes. Yeah, you're thinking, you're, yes. I like the way you're thinking. <laughs> it's kind of scary to think that you might be thinking the way I think, because, you know. <laughs> Did she say, oh, no? <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Junk food. You know, those Oreo cookies and things like that. I didn't mean to say that word again. 2,300 calories. Nuts and seeds will average out at 2,800. All oil and fat is 4,000. 
So here's what they did. So they did these studies on calorie density. Instead of putting you on like, you know, a certain low-fat diet and you on a calorie-controlled diet, they decided to feed people what's called ad libitum. And everybody know what ad libitum is now? That's a fancy scientific word that means you eat like you're eating here. You get to eat all you want at a buffet throughout the day. There's only two things that you're told. Whenever you're hungry, eat. Don't stuff yourself. Don't starve yourself. Just whenever you're hungry, eat till you're comfortably full. Hunger, we get rid of hunger. What the difference is, they take one group and you get to eat from buffets of foods low in calorie density. So this end. This group, you get to eat foods only that are high in calorie density. And here's what happens. The people who get the food that's low in calorie density take in way less calories and lose weight. Those who get to eat all they want of high calorie dense food, they take in way more calories and they gain weight. As I said, there's over 50 of these studies done now specifically on this, probably over 100 on the principle. And whether they do it for one meal, one day, one week, six months or a year, when you learn the principles of calorie density and you compare it to portion control, calorie control, low fat diets, guess which wins every time? Calorie density because they get to eat all they want and they don't ever have to go hungry. They just have to learn which foods. So, let's go to my next prop. And I'm going to show it to you up here on the slide, but I'm going to put it up here because we're going to come back to it a couple times. And so let me show you what they found out in these studies, and that's what those arrows are. Pretty much, if the food was 400 calories per pound or less, no matter how much you ate of it, Guess what happened to your weight? It went down. Even if you were a couch potato, it didn't matter. Eat all you want, you pretty much lost weight. Between four and 800 calories per pound, guess what happened? Most people, as long as you got in your typical amount of activity, you know what I mean, that you weren't a couch potato, you pretty much lost weight. The range was based on activity level. So the more active you were, the more likely you were to lose. The less active, the less likely. So it might have been kind of near the cutoff range, but for most people, if you did the basic 30 to 60 minutes a day, you still lost weight. Between 8 and 1,200 calories a pound, guess what happened? People gained weight. There was only one exception. There was only one group that didn't gain weight. You know who they were? The very active, the elite athletes. Over 1,200 calories per pound. Guess what? That's what I'm showing you up here. Guess what happened to everybody? They gained weight. Now, why is this important to you? Because in yesterday's talk, I showed you that when we did a study and we asked you what you ate, you said that one-third to one-half of your calories come from here. And that's when we asked you. And we know when we ask you that you might lie. And when we look at it, fudge, you might fudge. No, that's not a good word either. <laughs> so when we look at it other words, other ways, we know one-half to two-thirds of your calories are coming from here. So if this is where half to two-thirds of your calories are coming from, what's happening to everybody's weight? It's going up. No matter how much they're working out, if they're down at this end, correct? So you see what's happened in America? Now, if you go back 30 years ago, how many of these calorie-dense foods existed in the supermarket? Very few. So calorie density is becoming a very key concept. And just so we're going to see this a little later, but here's your breakouts, 400, 4 to 8, 8 to 12, and 12 and above. That's what you got to know. Very simple. And when they again looked at populations across the United States, here's what they found. Now they split this up between high fat and low fat, and they use 30% because when you're out in the world and you do regular studies, what do they think is the cutoff? 30. I would have chosen a different one. But look, they wanted to look at the, per the per prevalence of obesity based on the level of fat and the amount of fruits and vegetables because what's the food's lowest in calorie density? So the people who ate the most fruits and vegetables had to have the lower calorie dense diets. So the lowest prevalence of, prevalence of over obesity is in the low fat diet that eats the most fruits and vegetables. And by vegetables that also included foods like, you know, oatmeal and all those. Starchy vegetables too. Interesting, isn't it? 
the more fat you ate and the less fruits and vegetables, look what happened to the amount of obesity. So then they took these numbers and they translated them to calorie density. What was the calorie density of their diets? And we find out the group that had the least obesity, that had the lowest fat and the highest intake of fruits and vegetables, had a calorie density of 1.22 grams calories per gram, which in English is 550 calories per pound. What did I tell you was the midpoint? Interesting, isn't it? So then at the end of last year, how many of you heard about the Food, Nutrition, Physical Activity and the Prevention of Cancer Report, a global perspective? Boy, that was a mouthful. <laughs> I almost needed a glass of water to get through that. Have any of you heard about it? Jesus Christ. How many of you have heard of the Atkins diet? How many of you have heard of the South Beach diet? How many of you have read the Zone diet? This is available online for free. <laughs> Please read it. You know why? It was done by the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research. 100 scientists from 30 countries reviewed 7,000 studies for five years. This was the best of the best. And one of the first, the number one recommendation was to maintain a healthy body weight. That there's a strong relationship between body weight and many cancers and they came out with a recommendation. They also recommended a mostly plant food diet and that if you ate animal products, especially meat, to make it a bit like a condiment. And they gave a number to shoot for. They gave private goals, personal goals, and public health goals. And they said a public health goal is the average energy density, calorie density of diets should be lowered to 1.25 calories per gram or 550, five, can we round off to 550? we all be happy? See where we're going? So here we are again. Let's put them all together. All the studies in the labs, the cancer report, the studies on the population, this is what we're saying. Somewhere in here is our goal, calorie density, that our total diet should be around 550 calories per pound or less. And if it's there, we can pretty much see what we want never go hungry, and maintain and or lose our weight. You adjust slightly. Less is better. Here we start getting into trouble. Make sense to you? I spent a week working on that chart. Pretty cool, isn't it? That's like the best one I've made yet. I'm going to make that into a refrigerator magnet. Wouldn't that be good? Does anybody in here make refrigerator magnets? <laughs> oh, do you? Okay, see me afterwards. Yeah, I just thought about that. So, okay, so you see where we're getting at. Look at the foods that are low in calorie density. Look at the foods that you're getting to eat here. Does it make sense? Because I know some of you are nervous going, are you sure I could eat all this corn? I'm like, get your money's worth. <laughs> right? So let's keep going. Now, yes? Is there a way to look at a food label and figure out the calorie density? Um, if everybody didn't hear it, can you tell calorie density from a food label? And uh, well, you could use my theory that if it has a food label, just put it back. So okay, <laughs> you know, don't even bother figuring it out. Just put it back and walk over to the produce section quickly. You're safe there. But we'll go into that tomorrow. Unfortunately, no. And here's why. You can tell many bad foods or high calorie dense foods. If you do bread, cookies, cake, crackers you'll see they're very calorie dense if you do the math. It's not made for you to do it. You've got to do you know, a little math. Some of it's given in grams. But many good foods will appear to be high in calorie density because they're sold dry. But what do you do when you cook them? You add water. So oatmeal in a box is going to be very high in calorie density, but you add two parts water, which is all weight but no calories. So what happens to the calorie density? So unfortunately at the present time, no, but using this, guess where most of the packaged processed foods are? They're down here. That's why we have to limit those and be careful. It's no longer good, bad, salt, sugar, fat, all that. It's a calorie density and you saw the numbers on obesity and you saw what's happening in life expectancy. You can argue all you want with me over good fat, bad fat, percentage fat. Forget it. This is a bigger issue now. You need to lower the fat because you have to lower the calorie density or you're going to go hungry. 
See what's changed? I love it. Okay, these are my, I'm going to combine three studies here and show you the results. And you're going to understand a little more on how to make this work. So what they did is they brought people into a place like this for like a couple days. And there was an all-you-can-eat buffet. And uh, they got to eat at, you know, just like you do in here, ad libitum. And the buffet was like macaroni and cheese. So they got to come in, stay, eat all they want, macaroni and cheese, and they paid them. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Now I see lit up. He's like, wait a minute, I came here, I paid a lot of money, and I'm eating salad all I can get. They paid them to eat macaroni and cheese. He's like, honey, we're going somewhere else. So they let them eat all they wanted and they recorded how many calories they averaged at the meal. And it was, as you would expect, pretty high. So they said, okay, let's put these principles to work. Go back to buffet, but before you go to the buffet, eat a salad first. Eat this first, 50 calories. Then go to the buffet. Eat all you want. So when they ate the salad first, guess what happened to the total calorie density? They eat a 50 calorie salad. Guess what happened to the total caloric intake? It went down 7%. Now let's run numbers for a minute. If the average American eats 2,000 calories and by eating a salad before each meal you cut your caloric intake 7%, that's 140 calories. Theoretically, that could be 14 pounds in a year. So they said, okay, a little is good. More must be better. So they gave him a big salad. And they said, eat this first. This one was 100 calories. So eat the 100 calorie salad, then go eat all you want at the buffet. And guess what happened? It went down 12%. Think about that. So they said, OK, this is working pretty good. Let's see how they'll do in the real world. So they gave him a plate, and they sent him to the salad bar, and they said, go ahead, you make a salad yourself. So they did what most Americans did. And they put a little bit of, no, that's too much lettuce. They put a little bit of lettuce on it. Yeah, you're laughing, but you know why you're laughing. And then they loaded it up with bacon and croutons and cheese and regular fat dressing. All right, and guess what happened to the calories in the salad? And guess what happened to total calories? It went up 10%. So you see how you could use this information in the wrong way? So then they said, have a big bowl of vegetable soup. Chunky or regular, pureed or not. Just eat a big bowl of vegetable soup, then go eat all you want. Guess what happened? They ate the vegetable soup, they filled up, and then they ate all they wanted, and total calorie consumption went down 20%. 20 percent. 20. So, then they did another experiment, and they said, before you go to the, it was like a buffet, take a glass of juice, about 100 calories, drink it, then go eat all you want at the buffet. Guess how much the juice filled them up? It didn't, at all. So guess what happened to the total calories? It went up to the highest. Because liquid calories don't create any Oh, no satiety. So, don't drink your calories. Eat them. Make sense? Okay, so we've done carbohydrates. We've done calorie density. We've done satiety. Now let's talk about living long. And then we'll sum it all up. And then we'll go eat. Yeah. That gets more attention than me, more applause than me. Does anybody know the only proven way to extend life in human beings, uh, to extend life in animals? Limit their calories. It's called calorie restriction. It was first done in the 1930s by a guy named McKay, then a guy named Ray Walford was involved from UCLA. He just passed away about a year or two ago wrote many books on it, there are many studies done, they've done it on almost every animal you can imagine, from rats, mice, guinea pigs, cats, dogs, and every time they do it, they see the exact same thing. Now I want to explain something first, because there's two different things we're talking about. One is, 
getting the most out of your life. Okay, and that's called squaring the curve. Everybody know what I mean by that? Let me just show you quickly. Okay. Let's say we're all to live to that. That's the average life expectancy. What most of what we're trying to do for you is to see that you don't experience this. You know, a declining disability over the years. What we're trying to do is to get you to live a good, long, healthy life and then drop off, right? <laughs> get out of here, will you? No, you understand? We're not telling you we can make you live forever. We're just trying to give you the best. It's called squaring the curve. But what this has shown is they can move this to here and do this. Yeah. And what they found out is that if you take an animal like a mouse, and these are, this is the mouse studies, and uh, you see what it would normally eat when food is freely available, and then restrict, restrict it 10%, but make sure it gets all its nutrients, it lives 10% longer. If you do it 20%, it lives 20% longer. If you restrict the nutrients 40%, it lives 40% longer. That's pretty much around where the cutoff was, because then after that, you starve them. So you do need a certain amount of calories and nutrients. They've now done this in primates. Some of you may have seen it. It made front page of the science section in the New York Times, and it's been in others, showing the monkeys. It takes longer. Monkeys have longer lifespans, so we've got to wait longer to see the effects. But all the effects on the biomarkers, your cholesterol, LDL, HDL, heart disease, heart function, are excellent in the monkeys. And there's now trials going on in humans. The National Institute of Health is sponsoring several studies around the country on calorie restriction in humans. Now, it's going to take a while for these humans to go through their lifespan, but in the meantime, guess what's happening? Excellent results. Heart function, cholesterol levels, insulin, blood sugar. Just tremendous. So the only way to really extend your life is to eat a little less, but make sure you get in all your nutrients. So remember I showed you this yesterday? They looked at the long-lived populations, and where there's more people over the age of 100 than anywhere else per capita in the world is... Okinawa, the island of Okinawa has more people over the age of 100 per capita than anywhere else in the world. Well, other than Boca Raton, Florida, but you know. <laughs> they're still counting there. So they don't know how many are there yet. They're, they're on their third count. Okay, Sardinia, Italy is one of the top. And it's a little different than... Just like Okinawa is a little different than mainland Japan, they're a little different than mainland Italy because it's a little separate, isolated community. And we know about these. That's the Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, in California, the, they live seven to ten years longer than the average Californian. So, big difference. So, I showed you this yesterday, plant-based diet. They all eat a plant-based diet. They don't smoke. They have constant, moderate physical activity. And for most of them, that doesn't mean they go to gyms. If you were listening to Alec, you don't ever have to go to a gym. Guess how, for most of these people, they get constant, moderate physical activity. They walk and they work. Like the old order Amish I showed you, in their daily lives. Simple. Social engagement. See, getting together like this. Sitting around, having fun, going out, being around people. I live in uh, southeast Florida. I think I mentioned that. I originally came from Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn, and now I live in Florida and all my family has moved down there. And in case you don't know, that's like the sixth borough down where I live. <laughs> yeah, there's actually even a subway train. It goes straight from, um, no, it goes straight from Brooklyn to Palm Beach. Did you know that? It's called JetBlue. It's nonstop. It goes, it's like a subway. So all my family's down, and, and I love my family. We get together all the time, and... Uh, you know, it's, uh, we have big things like Thanksgiving, there'll be 50 of us. Passover, there could be 20 of us. We get to, it's a great thing to be around people. All these communities you go to, like in Sardinia, they have a Sunday meal that lasts hours. Everybody gets together. So my family gets together all the time. They never tell me where they're getting together. <laughs> but I always figure it out. And I find them. Really? You know, I've been doing this for like 30 years. I mean, professionally, for almost 20. 
there's no secret to what I do. My family knows very well all about me, who I've worked for, and what my principles are, right? So, I go to their house on Thanksgiving, 50 of them are there, what's the first thing they say to me? Are you still on that stupid diet? <laughs> I says, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got on Atkins. Did you cook any extra ribs this month? <laughs> it's crazy, right? They say, okay, good, just go out back and graze. <laughs> okay, so who is the longest lived population? I mean, there's some, uh, other isolated areas, but in general, it's Okinawa. They outdo Japan. Now, are the Mediterranean countries, Greece, Italy, do they do better? This is the incidence of heart disease. Do they have lower rates than America? Yeah, yeah but who's got the lowest? Okinawa and Japan. And in fact, when you look at life expectancy, if you're 65, how much longer are you going to live? Again, who's number one? Japan. Look, here's Mediterranean countries. They're not the best. Are they better than the U.S.? Yeah, but they're not the best. So here it is. Calorie restriction. The traditional Okinawa diet. It turns out the Okinawans practice a form of calorie restriction. And that's why they're different than mainland Japan. This just came out in the annals of the New York Academy of Science. That's about as good of a journal as you could get. And what they actually did, there's a lot of theories about what they ate or do eat or don't eat. And remember, times have changed even for them. So they decided to go back and check all their records. But first, let's look at the difference in disease rates. And I copied right out of the study, so I want you to see, I know it's a little hard to see, the, the Okinawa, right, is the darkest, Japan is the white, and U.S. is the shaded. This is coronary heart disease, male and female. Notice how much lower Japan is, but notice how much lower Okinawa is than even Japan especially in women. Here's colon cancer, male and female. You see the exact same thing. Japan's way lower than we are, but look at Okinawa. And same thing for prostate and breast cancer and also lymphomas. So not only is the Southeast Asian Japanese diet healthy, look at Okinawa. They practice something called Hari Hachibu. Anybody know what that means? Yes. That's correct. Hari Hachibu is Yiddish for eating until you're 80% full. So, well, it's practice. It takes a lot of practice. Um, because you know before you're full, so they just don't eat to that point where they're stuffed. They leave food over. Yes, sir. <laughs> Who taught him? There was a guy named Sam Bernstein. He went over, his boat got lost and it didn't land at Rikers Island. He kept going to Okinawa. So, okay, so you can see the difference. So now I want to show you. Here's what they did. They went back to pre-1950 to find out what the Okinawans ate. Because if you're 100 or 110 today, when did you really get in most of your calories? You know what I mean? What really made the difference in your life? The first 50 years. Plus, in 1950, after the war, it changed. So they went back to pre-1950. They ate 1,785 calories in Okinawa. Japan ate almost 2,100. So they were eating less. But I want to show you some numbers, because this is now the diet of the longest-lived people when it had the biggest influence on them. Because you go there today, it might be a little different. Look at the calorie density. 1.4, which relates to the same numbers we were looking at earlier. 1.2, 1.25, 1.4, it's all right about the same. So we have the same numbers again, right in here. It was 9% protein, it was 85% carb, it was 6% fat, and 3.6 grams of fatty saturated fat, 3.7. That's 1.8% calories from saturated fat. 1.8. That's, that's like a fifth of what we get in America. Now let's look here at the actual foods they ate. Sweet potatoes made up 70% of their calories. 
Sweet potatoes, 12% came from rice, 7% 7 came from other grains, 6% came from beans, and soy wasn't the main bean. There was a lot of other beans. And now let's look here. Fish, 15 grams a day of fish. Anybody know what that equals in ounces? That's a half ounce. They were not fish eaters. They were sweet potato eaters. Look at meat. Three grams a day. Right, and now how about oil? Did they, three grams of, that's less than a teaspoon of oil a day. So people say, well, you know, in Okinawa, they use lard. Yeah, they use three grams a day. <laughs> that's two-thirds of a teaspoon, or three-quarters of a teaspoon. A little bit of seaweed, a little bit of fruit. Uh, it looks like they had a little bit to drink there, too. Meat, eggs, dairy, unheard of. 80% less osteoporosis than we do. They don't even drink dairy. Think about that. So then we went to the Chinese centenarians. I mean, if you're going to find people, right, find people who are long-lived, see what they're doing. 55% of their calories are dried sweet potatoes. 15% is whole grains. 10% is vegetables. 10% is beans. Put these together, 70, 80, 90% 90 of their calories are vegetables. And they only ate about 1,400 calories a day. Also a form of slight calorie restriction. Now I'm putting up one more. I will show you the numbers. I know this is difficult to see. This is the Tarahumara Indians. Anybody know them? They live in the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico. They are, their population is considered anti-atherogenic. Their diet and their lifestyle. There is zero heart disease amongst them. They're also considered some of the best endurance athletes in the world. Said it's virtually impossible to outrun anybody from the Tarahumara tribe. Are you ready? Here's the calories. Here, they actually went down there and they weighed and measured everything these guys ate up in the mountain, these guys and gals. 19% of their calories came from beans. 71% came from corn. 90, 71, 90, 90% of their calories came from Two foods, corn and beans. Remember how you heard earlier, you don't need a big variety, you could keep it simple? Well, guess what? The longest lived people in the world eat two, three, four foods. It makes up 70, 80, 90% of calories, and most of it is starchy vegetables with fruits and veggies, mostly veggies. So let's put it all together. You're going to have to leave here and go home. So what are you going to do? I call it living healthy in an unhealthy world. This is the part you're going to love. It's the calorie density solution. Here you go. Focus on foods that are low in calorie density. Make sense to you? All the bulky foods. That's fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, starchy vegetables, legumes. That's what you're doing here. That should be the preponderance of the foods you eat. Foods that are high in calorie density, like refined and processed carbs, junk food, and fast food, start cutting back. Start limiting them. And that's why the answer to the question about processed and packaged foods, I mean, without exception, they're going, to be in the, they're going to be more down here. There's almost no exception. This is the secret. Principle two, dilute the calorie density of foods that are a little heavier. All right? So, it doesn't mean you can never eat foods down here, but what if you mix them with foods here? What happens to the average calorie density? Right, if you take, remember that bowl of nuts and the potatoes? What if you mix them? Right, makes sense? So my ratio is up to one to one. And let me show you. You go out to a restaurant and you ask for a bowl of pasta. And let's say they happen to have whole wheat pasta and they bring you a big bowl. It's four cups. That's 700 calories. The calorie density of it is 563. So it's right in the middle, not bad. Whole wheat pasta is one of the only exceptions to the refined and processed carbs. Can you find whole wheat pasta growing in the garden? No. Right, so it's not a unrefined carb. But when you cook pasta, what do you cook it in? And what does it do? It actually has the calorie density of potatoes, rice, and all the others because it absorbs the water. So whole wheat pasta is the only exception. So this falls right in the middle, and for most of you, it's probably going to be just fine. But what if you want to lose weight a little faster? 
or you're just not that active. Maybe you got a bad knee or a bad ankle, or I heard that talk earlier, you have a good ankle, but you have bad arthritis in something, right? So you're not that active, and maybe you're not losing weight, and you're eating this every night. So let's dilute it out. Let's keep the four cups, but let's take a cup of the pasta out, get rid of it, and substitute a cup of? Brach. I like you. This went from 700 calories to 560 calories. It went down 20%. The calorie density went down 25%. It's now over here. See what we did? Did you give up any food? Which would be more filling? Which actually has more fiber and water? This one. So maybe this still isn't enough for you. You still want to lose weight faster, but you don't want to go hungry. So now let's give up half. Now we got down to 430 calories. The calorie density is 350 calories per pound. See what happened? What is the likelihood of you overeating on this one compared to the first one? It's slim. It's really slim. And at the end, which one had more vitamins and minerals, water, fiber, and everything else good for you? This one. And you didn't have to give up any food. In fact, you'll walk away from this one going, oh, I can't eat all that. Now, I know you're probably saying, well, what do you top it with? What would be a good thing to top this with that might actually lower calorie density more? Tomatoes. But should you use liquid thin tomato sauce or a chunky tomato sauce? Chunky, because chunky has more bulk. Okay, let's keep going. We're almost done. Sequence foods. That's what you're doing here. Remember I showed you what happens if you eat a salad first or a soup first? Do them both. Start out your meals with salad and soup. This way you'll fill up for the least amount of calories and what's the likelihood you're going to overeat no matter what the entree is? It goes down. But let's face it, you sit down at the table, you're really hungry. They got a nice entree, they got a salad. Which one do you go for first? You always go for the entree. We always go for the more calorie-rich, calorie-dense food. So you've got to outsmart yourself. I mean, how many of you are going to fill up on the entree and then go, oh, I forgot to eat a salad? <laughs> Nobody. So think about it. Eat the salad and the soup first. Simple, don't drink your calories, right? I showed you that. It's only going to add to your caloric load for the day. Last but not least, and this is where we'll be ending, Vegetables have the lowest in calorie density by far. So if you just add vegetable and the highest satiety, so if you add vegetables to any food, what automatically happens to the calorie density? It goes down. What happens to satiety? So don't just make pasta anymore. Make pasta and? Don't just make rice. Make rice and? Don't just make potatoes. Make potatoes and? When you come down for breakfast in the morning, you want oatmeal, don't just have oatmeal. Have oatmeal and? Broccoli. <laughs> She thinks like me too. What's the next best thing? Veggies or fruit. The more you add, the lower the calorie density. And which is the best out of both of them? Veggies. Okay, oil and fat, the highest in calorie density by far. So when you add even a little bit of oil and fat to food, what happens to the calorie density? It goes way up. Does it fill you up anymore? Remember that big bowl of pasta, 700 calories? And then I dropped it down to 350 by adding in the vegetables. If I added just two tablespoons of oil to the pasta, guess what happens to the calorie density? It's worse than the original bowl. Does it fill you up anymore? No. Be very careful with the oil. Okay, so what it has, does this really work? So they went to Hawaii because they have a similar thing. You know, the diets have changed. So they looked, they took uh, 29 Hawaiians for 21 days. Very famous study, there's books out about it called The Hawaiian Diet. It's done by Terry Shintani. And what they were, the Hawaiians were eating pretty much the standard American diet that's supposed to be a little low in fat and high in carb. You know, 30, 35% fat. And that's what it was. It was 32% fat, 51% carb, 17% protein. Then they put them on the ancestral Hawaiian diet. They used to be taro. Right? And sweet potatoes. Ad libitum. Everybody know that? So they put them on. <laughs> We're all scientists now. Tonight you could eat ad libitum. They ate ad libitum on a very low fat, very high carb diet. The fat went from 32 to 7. The carbs went from 51 to 78. And the protein went from about the same. Guess what happened? 
eating all they wanted. The caloric intake dropped 40%. Remember the mice? And what happened when you drop your calories? You live longer, from 2,600 to 1,600 calories, you know, averaging out. They lost 22 pounds in 21 days. Their cholesterol decreased 15%. Their blood pressure went down 11.5 systolic, 8.9 distal. Guess what's happening to their longevity? So they went back a few years later and they did it again. Because, you know, as soon as the study was over, you know what all those Hawaiians did? They said, where's McDonald's? <laughs> So they did it again. They took 29 wines for 21 days. Same diet. Again, ad libitum. No portion or calorie restriction. The results, this time they only lost 11 pounds, but still in 21 days, that's pretty good. Diastolic blood pressure went down oh, about 4 points. Cholesterol fell almost 50 points. That's 25%. LDL fell from 125 to 94. That's almost 30 points. Wow. Triglycerides almost dropped almost like 40%. Blood sugar fell from 112 to 91. How did that happen? So in summary, we started with a picture. We're going to end with a picture because, you know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words, right? So you've been here for a couple days. You have a great time. You love the food. You lose a little weight. You feel better. Hopefully you've laughed at one or two of my jokes <clears throat> Hopefully you've laughed at one or two of my jokes. Okay. So then you go home and you go, okay, let's go out to eat. And you go to an Italian restaurant because, you know, they got pasta. And you sit down, the waiter comes over and says, uh, can I take your order? And you say, yes. I just came from this program called the McDougal program. I'm now a McDougaler. Do a little McBugling on the side, but I'm a McDougaler. And uh, I would like to get a bowl of pasta, but I learned about calorie density, so what I want you to do is add vegetables to it. And of course, the guy looks at you kind of funny and says, okay. And then he brings you out this. That's a bowl of pasta with two pieces of zucchini on the outside. <laughs> Have you been to these restaurants? Yes. And you say, wait a minute. This is not what I was talking about. What I'm talking about is knocking out about half of the pasta and putting in a lot of zucchini and broccoli and all that, right? Because I said at least do it up to 50-50. Don't go beyond that because you need some of that bulky starch to fill you up, the weight and all that. So you said 50-50, but what if they did go a little further? What if instead of going half and half, they went one-third pasta, two-thirds vegetables? Or half-half? Let's look. Here's 50-50. Right, so we went from three cups whole wheat pasta to a cup. We went from a cup of pasta sauce to um, stay the same. We added in a cup and a half of ratatouille, a cup and a half of acorn squash, a cup of portobello, a cup of pasta sauce. We have, right, one and a half pounds to two pounds. The amount of food went up 33%. The calories went down from 600 to 400. The calories went down almost... 40%. We got almost a third more food and we cut the calories by just over a third. Does that make sense to you? Do you think you could do that at home? I mean, look what I've been showing you. Let's just do a summary. If you add in a 50 calorie salad, you reduce calor caloric intake 7%. Add in a 100 calorie salad, it's 12%. Add in a big soup, it's 20%. Do the 75-25, you know, one-fourth veggies, you cut it 20%. Do 50-50, you go 38%. What if you do all of these? You end up looking like me. That's a good thing. So do you think you could do this? That's a pretty wimpy answer for some people who are going to go out of here and do this. Do you think you could do this? Oh, look, there's my house. There's my multi-quart cooker. There's my bowl of holy pasta. And next to it, my bowl of veggies. So what do you got to do? Mix them together. And then what do you got to do? Make some chunky sauce. And then what do you do? Mix it all together. See how easy it is? Thank you.